put off by how long this video is. Don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, Mood Review. Robin of Loxley escapes a Turkish jail and in doing so he is accompanied by another man and this is an attempt to deal with the Islamophobia inherent to the Crusades, the, the war propaganda from back then. And it, you know, just, just to be fair, there's propaganda in pretty much every war. But yes, we are given a very helpful, friendly, wise character who is a Muslim, Azim, and this character was in part, you know, the first time this kind of character was used in a Robin Hood story was a 1984 British TV series. And when Robin saves his life, he vows to return that, you know, yeah, repay that debt. And Freeman is, of course, great, charismatic, and charming as ever. And some have said that, you know, he becomes kind of a running joke to an extent, maybe. And the, the, the two of them travel to England, where the sheriff is harming the people, and Alan Rickman was told that he could do what he wanted in his interpretation of the character, and yeah, he plays it kind of campy, almost like he thinks he's in the Mel Brooks version, and yeah, he's he's a fun villain, as he always is, and the, yeah, he is, you know, cruel, excessively taxing, burning the houses, which we actually see here. I, it's, it's been a while since I've watched other versions of Robin Hood, but, you know, I just rewatched again because it's amazing, the 1938 version, and, yeah, you, you don't see, you're told that the, you know, the, the peasants are being blinded, having their houses burned, but you don't see it. In this, you actually see these awful things happening. And it does, you know, that was something that you could do in 90s action movies, show really horrible things being done to, you know, innocents, where, you know, in 1938, it was maybe a little less, yeah. And... <laughs> He, he has the line, call off Christmas, which I'd like to hear Azim's reaction to. And the... Yeah, when, when reading reviews for this, one of the reviews that praised Rickman's performance also said that this is the best Robin Hood in over 50 years, which I think is saying that yeah, it doesn't really top the 1938 one, so I approve. And the, you know, for, for how serious the movie overall is, you know, sometimes there are these comedy scenes and comedic performances where Rickman very much, yeah, he slimes his way across the screen and he is, you know, he's working with his cousin, Michael Wincott, who plays the Guy of Gisborne character, and unfortunately he doesn't really get to fence. I mean, hello, the crow, that I, I can't believe they cast him and then didn't use that. And I know the crow came out a little later than this. It's still, 
Yeah. My biggest issue with these villains, though, is that there's just, they don't get enough screen time. And this is, again, something I really, when comparing it to the 38, they, yeah, the, the villains are given a good amount of screen time. We really get to see the, you know, the types of people they are. Their, their character really shines through. And they have some really defining moments in this. But, yeah, they just don't have enough screen time. We're, we spend a lot of time with Robin and the Merry Men. And it just, yeah, it, it takes some away from what they could have been, what, yeah. And they're also working with Mortiana, a witch that raised the the Sheriff of Nottingham, who, yeah, played by, I might not have stated that, but that's the character that Alan Rickman plays. And the, and, and there's a corrupt bishop that is also part of this. And the, yeah, the, the sheriff is trying to take King Richard the Lionheart's throne while he is off in the Crusades, presumably also robbing his own people and watching children walk to their deaths. It's, I, I didn't make that up, look it up. And with the Robin becomes an outlaw, joining the Merry Men in the woods, and they start robbing soldiers and stopping convoys to redistribute it to the poor. And that's also something, again, you really see here, you see them actually, you, you see these, the peasants' people's lives ruined, their property burnt to the ground, and then they go into the forest and they actually get, you know, some some money, some some food and various things. And yeah, so again, really not just stating that this is happening, but very much actually visual, you know, film, visual medium showing that these things are happening. And the this is very much the gritty realistic 90s action hero take on this character and I think an argument could be made that it's it's an interesting direction to go for something that started out as this merry folk legend, you know. Nevertheless, I quite enjoyed the film. And Carrie Elwes was offered the role of Robin Hood in this and he turned it down for the for how contrived the plot is and yeah. And the, you know, Carrie Elwes, of course, playing Robin Hood in the Brooks version. And this version has no Prince John, which it's it's one of the only ones I know where there's no Prince John's, where, where it's the sheriff directly who wants the throne. And I think that also takes some away from the villain presence in this to not have, yeah, an actual Prince John. In addition to this version, I've also watched The Adventures of Robin Hood, the 1938 Errol Flynn, Olivia de Havilland film, played the game Robin Hood, The Legend of Sherwood. I've watched the Disney version and the Cameron Crowe one, as well as, of course, read various books about him when I was a child, which I don't recall the titles of, and frankly, they might have been written specifically in Danish. Anyway, yeah, the 1938 is easily my favorite Robin Hood story, but yeah, this one definitely has its own identity and personality, and yeah, you know, the, the 90s got a lot of, you know, had a lot of distinct anti-hero movies, action flicks, and yeah, this this is a good entry into that. Costner, 
some say he's he's really wooden. I'm I'm not sure I'm the best person to really judge. I thought he did fine. The you know, he maybe is has a bit of a monotone voice and it really feels wrong that he doesn't have the goatee. You know, some some straight up say that he was miscast. He's fine. Unlike some other Robin Hoods, he cannot speak with an English accent to save his life. And it really, normally, I, you know, I'm fine with it. It's, it's, you know, it's a different, it's an actor who maybe doesn't do that kind of accent or whatever. But it's not a different language. It's just the accent. And this is a an English folk legend. You know, it, I would take issue with someone putting on a really you know British accent in some really classically American story as well now I would say that unlike the Errol Flynn one Costner really isn't someone that you see rallying people it's noteworthy than that in this one he takes over little John's merry men rather than starting the you know the movement is and that again in in the 1938 movie you see you know robin actually go and speaking to all these men who are just peasants who who have not agreed to fight yet and he gives this rousing speech where you practically you know cheer along and agree to join him and yeah, and this, I mean, he, Costner gives some speeches, but yeah, it's just, it's not as compelling as, as Flynn's one. Yeah, overall, I don't really have much of an opinion on Costner. I, I love Dances with Wolves, but that's really more for its politics than necessarily his performance. And this is a fairly fun take on Robin Hood. And some say it really lacks the spirit, casting him in a shadow of doubt. Again, it's, you know, this is what you would get in the 90s with, you know, even a take on such a colorful and cheery character. Yeah, you're going to get this kind of take on it. And again, you know, this, he has far more wit and has more fun than a number of the other anti-heroes and the this may be the shortest Kevin Costner movie and that's you know um, it's two hours and 13 minutes not counting the end credits and the end credits at about four minutes to that and then you know or at least my version is I've heard some say it's more like two and a half hours so I don't know exactly but yeah I, I don't know that my version was particularly cut like here in Denmark we don't particularly cut for violence and such so which is a really good reason to learn Danish and come live here and watch movies here now the you know, this one has him take a nude swim, you know, offering something for the ladies. It does not have the archery tournament, and, you know, it's, it does have the iconic image of him splitting arrow, you know, an arrow that hit right in the bullseye, but, yeah, you really do miss the, the archery tournament, but he does at least have the staff duel with little john and it's it's a really good memorable fight this of course has the romantic you know pop song everyone i silence is a critic i mean everything i do i do it for you and the you know, this Marion Mast Mastria Antonio probably got that wrong, but yeah, she is 
very sexy uh, of, of Omerin, and they accomplish this without really overly sexualizing her, but she is very much a physical presence, and she, yeah, just the, the you know, the, the looks and the, yeah, just the, the way the two of them are together. It's more palpably sexy, where, again, the, the Flynn, it's very sweet and very, you know, first time in love kind of thing. There, there's a scene where Marion, you know, talks with her, I guess, handmaiden about the, the, you know, how it feels to be in love, the, the, you know, goosebumps and all this stuff. And yeah, in this one, and it's also quite noteworthy, her handmaiden in this, packs a punch she's you know this yeah she she really like everyone including the women gets to kick at least some ass every every good guy character in this gets to kick some ass and yeah that includes marion and this handmaiden and the handmaiden is also you know not really like she's she's built you know and yeah the the there's no like weak woman in this the little john also has a wife and she too really gets to you know be be really important and such and also with a theme in the reviews i read was Sort of making fun of her yelling out Robin in the near, near the climax, and yeah, that is very over the top. And unlike De Havilland's Marion, this one almost becomes a victim, and it's where where De Havilland was a an active player in the plot and didn't actually she there's only so much I can say without spoiling but you know she isn't just a woman so she needs to be a victim she actually has a role to play she's not just there to be you know won by Robin and in this one, this was this is one of the cases where they define they part of what defines a bad guy or something they use to paint a bad guy as especially awful is to make him rapey, and I mean that's literally that's his introduction in this one. The you know it might be the first time or maybe it's the second time that you really see Rickman. He's literally sitting there with, you know, a woman who he's clearly either just raped or just about to rape. And later they, you know, it's, it's not just a throwaway, it's a, it's a character trait, it's an ongoing thing. And they actually do a few really tasteless jokes with it. And I, I think they're supposed to be at least most of them, at the expense of him, of, at the expense of the rapist, not the rape victim, but it's still, you know, in this summer blockbuster, and, and even without that, the movie doesn't follow up on these women. It's not about what rape does to the victim and her family and friends. It's just, here's a rapist, hate him. And yeah, now the Will Scarlet O'Hara, which he mostly just goes by Scarlet. It's you know it's it's easier on job applications and such. Is here played by Christian Slater, and I don't like Christian Slater, but he's pretty good in this. He's he's fun, and yeah, 
and Brian Blessed has a cameo as Robin's father, and he is awesome because he's Brian Blessed. And there is some really cheesy dialogue in this one. This is done by the director of the pretty good 187 and also Waterworld, but I have not watched that. The Its reputation preceded it, and I chose to stay on land. The, the producers, including Costner, who was like a friend of the director, locked out the director's own editor and re, you know, edited the film without the director's, you know, they, they showed the, the final cut to him that was required by contract, but he was not real happy with what they had done with it. This did quite good box office and you can see why. It is a an enjoyable blockbuster. Now it has been called murky, unfocused, too violent, you know, depressing and not as light and romantic as you expect from Robin Hood. You know, gory, too too broad, the the melodrama and overacting really you know making give, giving Mel Brooks plenty of targets for his parody that came out two years later. And that one is definitely a better film than this. You ask me. Overall, I I do still like this film, but it definitely has some issues. It has quite good scale, and it very much wishes to be relevant to modern audiences. The final 40 minutes, you know, including the climax, are a lot of fun, and the sword fighting is quite well choreographed. This probably has at least a few too many subplots, and it is too long, and especially for a film that has so little villain presence. When you hire Alan Rickman and Michael Wincott, you know, you want to see them, you want to see these, of, and, and Michael Wincott just owns it. They, they do this, they, they like yellow up his teeth and just his, his glare and the whole thing. He is so much fun and as is Rickman and just, yeah, we get way too little of them. And the... You know, the, the political allegory is a bit too much, perhaps. And the... Yeah, it's, it's very much, you know... Not sure quite preaching, but very much, you know, almost preaching in, you know, the areas of civil rights, feminism, religious freedom, and economic freedom for all, which are clearly, you know, I'm a liberal, I very much support those values, but it is maybe a tad obvious where I think, you know, several of those values were in the, you know, the Earl Flynn one from 1938, but they were more, they felt more organic, they didn't feel worked into the, the folk hero legend, but arising naturally from him, from the legends. And it has a heavy focus on its religious themes, and that works pretty well, although, you know, they, they kind of make Robin the dumb Christian so that they can show the, the you know, Islam in a more positive light, Muslims in a more positive light, where he, you know, he introduces Robin to spyglasses, and yet, you know, Robin is clearly capable of building these advanced treetop, you know, this advanced treetop fortress, and yeah, just in general, and 
I mean, again, I'm, I am in favor of it. The, the, you know, the, the Muslim world has given us a ton of incredible inventions, you know, and it, they deserve credit for that, which too often today, even some liberals won't give them that credit or insist that, well, that was back then. We shouldn't, you know, worry, you know, that, that, I mean, today, if they want to build a clock, they have to just reverse engineer it. And <sighs> Bill Maher does not speak for me, nor does any other anti-vaxxer, nor does his buddy Sam Harris and his support for racial profiling. The over-the-top action is plentiful and an awful lot of fun, and you do get to see Robin do all the things you want to see, you know, amazing shots with the bow and arrow, and, you know, he is bested at times by, you know, he does have some trouble in the, you know, the staff match with Little John, and yeah, you know, f good sword fighting and just, yeah. And again, the, the love between him and Marion is really, you know, yeah, it's, it, it works. And yeah, it's a very enjoyable 90s blockbuster. And there are, of course, anachronisms and, yeah, various elements like that. I've reviewed other parts of this franchise, the links are in the description box. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.